I'll just say outside metropolitan cities, there is still a sense of community, but not to the degree of the mid 20th century, for sure. There is nothing that unifies all Americans. In fact, many people find the, the history of the country dreadful. In times of adversity, but the oh Lord of hosts have mercy on us. We're kind of making sure that guys like us who don't necessarily follow mainstream orthodoxy amongst, you know, many popular beliefs and different things are kind of being shied away from teaching younger people because generations ago, people like you and I would have been leaders in our community, but now we're like pariahs almost. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, there's not really much community left in America. I'll just say outside metropolitan cities, there is still a sense of community, but not to the degree of the mid 20th century for sure. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that's been really sad. And I think that's part of why the extreme division within the United States is there is no shared ethos. There is no shared as um, Peter Berger, a famous sociologist argued, a sacred canopy, a, a collection of symbols and myths and heroes and historic real people that, that then reify a sort of cultural identity of people. I think that's been shattered in America. And so there is nothing that unifies all Americans. In fact, many people find the, the history of the country, uh, you know, dreadful and don't want to associate with it. In fact, want to destroy it and trans form it into something else. Yeah. And I think a lot of people tend to find their community around political beliefs, which I think kind of sucks if I'm being honest. Um, I'm beyond blessed to play in a wonderful band and have wonderful people where we disagree on a host of issues. But, um, you know, those issues that we do disagree on, we can talk about them like adults and we enjoy right. each other's company outside of that. But, you know, you see this whole phenomena with Trump and then amongst like these crazy woke progressives where like if you don't worship the state of Israel and worship Trump, then you're outside my community. Or right. if you don't, you know, affirm my pronouns and believe in all the woke ideology, then you're outside of my community as well so I, I think we eliminated a lot of this community and replaced it with hollow political identities where right. people just kind of brand themselves on the internet is that no i totally agree and i think social media has a huge role in that because right. of the disconnectedness of actual face-to-face -face interactions people right. then take on labels to, as their sole source of identity so mm -hmm. you know ethnicity where, where you come from these types of things your religion um these aren't our primary identification identifications as as who we are it's more so now um what your sexual orientation is what type of clothing brands you purchase and so this is all a degradation of identity and unfortunately because uh, america many and i'm actually writing about this in my dissertation is the, mm -hmm. the first and second great awakening was influenced by a millenarian perspective of like creating a, a worldly utopia for christ's kingdom mm -hmm. and america was believed even before the revolution that it was going to be the second eden and so i think there's a presupposition with among americans and i'm just as guilty as anybody else that we have totally fell victim to this concept of progress and have no historical identity or perspective whereas you know, if you come from Greece or, you know, you come from Albania or, um, you know, Armenia, you're going to have a historical perspective of people, language, who you are. Uh, and I think as Americans, because it's so consumeristic now, it's in and, and progressivism, whether you're claim to be a conservative or not, mm -hmm. like you're still on the same idea that, oh, we're, we're progressing in so many ways and society is so much better. But you know, what what metric do we judge if society is better? Is it refrigeration? Is it morality? Is it lifespans? What what metric do we use to judge whether society is better or not? And I think if you're coming from a traditional Christian perspective, we could say that, yeah, in, in a material way, there's many improvements. But as people, I think we're actually becoming less than our ancestors used to be because Suffering is something that's, and this is Christianity proposes this, that suffering is actually what brings you closer to God and elevates you. And I, I know you're into fitness and me too. And that same mentality is how you build a muscle is you have to <laughs> stress it. You have to fatigue it. You have to nurture it and then let it rest. And then it grows back bigger and stronger. And I think we as people that I think that's a metaphor for almost everything. And so this movement, especially transhumanism and technology is trying to alleviate suffering. And what that's doing is creating uh, neoteny, a term for, the retention of juvenile characteristics. People are becoming more and more juvenile, more and more childlike, and the state is becoming the authoritative figure and the God, as communism proposes, basically the, the deific 
entity for most people. Yeah, um, I want to read the super chat real quick. Um, CG here from Comatevix channel, support the people who support your people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this kind of leads to another question. And I, I like how you kind of framed it around like, are we necessarily better off? Because there is this idea, like you said, with progress, where we're making all these technological advancements, you know, people are living longer. But you know, at the same time, we're also seeing birth rates decline, which like and literacy. Yes, yeah, that too. IQ so, first time in recorded history, IQ okay. dropped at three years in a row. I actually didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. So I, I mean, are we really better off if we can, you know, stream all the stuff that we do on our cell phones and then have AC around us, but though, you know, we don't have kids and you know, new lives kind of coming about. Um and you know new ideas through new generations and stuff like that it's there's a lot kind of in this whole you know the whole deal with the enlightenment where you know should we just kind of focus all our ideas of progress solely based on you know the fact that we have a greater standard of living because um there's like this inverse relationship of where we get more and more technologically and economically advanced but though like the human capital and like the amount of kids that people have kind of goes away. Um, I, I found that fascinating. And I, I kind of want to ask, it's like, can we have both where we like raise everybody, everybody's living standards where we're not doing such tedious labor, but still have giant prosperous, you know, potentially religious um, communities and families. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting point. Uh, again, it, like with my dissertation, tracking the the ideas of transhumanism alleviating suffering and labor is actually one of the main impetus although beginning in the 1800s or the 19th century for why technological advance was going to create a sort of global utopia and it was going to elevate and redeem man to the state of adam before the fall so everything that adam lost man was going to recover through technology so and whether people believe in God or not, I think most transhumanists actually have that presupposition still built in into their worldview. And so when you're asking about, um, you know, technology's influence, how did you put it exactly? But basically, like there's an inverse relationship of technology as we get more technologically advanced that people seem to have less and less kids. Right. And yeah. I was going to make the point that from a Christian perspective, when Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, no matter how any listener, you know, believes uh, that's for your own. I'm not here to do apologetics, but sure. they were casted out and man had the toil and labor and a woman had birth pangs. Right. So we see that technology is trying to alleviate manual labor, mm -hmm. which is something that man it was essential for man's duty. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was part of his uh, the taint after the fall is that he would have to work. And then also we see women not having children. And so I think at, from a spiritual level, this is a sort of moving away from the duties and responsibilities that we as humans have. Now, can you have a prosperous country with a high GDP and high standard of living and still be somewhat ethical? I suppose theoretically it, it, you could, but you would have to have a culture and an ethos that's embedded within a morality that collectively everybody's on the same page of, of like ethical behavior and, and like what's the point of our culture? If you're if the point of your culture is to get more and more GDP and more and more things, which, of course, is the contemporary American mind of consumerism, then it's hard. You know, where where does morality come into play? And if the only thing is about consumption and pleasure and hedonism and not about responsibility and children and family, well, then you just jerk off to OnlyFans girls and you consume. You consume products, you consume brands, you consume people, you consume you know, passive sexual activity. And I think all this stuff is, again, a juvenile characteristics that for us to actually mature as a species, the only way we can do so is through gaining skills as men, which means that you have to work at something. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do manual labor per se, although mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly beneficial. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, I think uh, th this movement towards, you know, these uh, white collar economy and stuff, again, sort of festers uh, the dispositions that we're talking about. So I think you could. But unfortunately, there is no Western nation that you could say is still explicitly Christian. I mean, name a Western European nation, Canada. I mean, America would be the, your best shot. And right. I think you could make an argument because of the self-identification of most Americans is to still to be a Christian. But when you look at the values, when you look at 
the cultures that the people create, right? We can talk about intelligent agencies and propaganda and the influence of people through media, Hollywood, all this different stuff, but it comes down to our free will being made in the image of God. How do you, what do you choose to do? And, and how, how are you going to utilize your free will? And I think, unfortunately, we don't live in a Christian society, despite what the majority of the nation identifies as, as their religious identity. Yeah. I, something that really struck me to my core was when you kind of compared it to the Garden of Eden. And once again, I'm not religious necessarily. I'm still agnostic, but I'm still kind of exploring all these concepts and ideas because they truly interest me. But when you said that uh, basically we alleviated man's duty to work and then now women don't have kids, I, I've th there was a sincere feeling that I had when you said that. And um, you know, I know myself as a guy, you know, who goes to work every single day to beat, you know, 200,000 mile GMC trucks day in, day out. Um, there, there's something intrinsically rewarding about that, as frustrating as it can be. When the job's done, it's done right, it feels good. And, um, you know, I'm sure that women feel great when they're doing, you know, motherly activities. But, um, you know, and same deal, like you kind of brought up working out you know, when you hit the, you know, the next PR right now, I'm working on getting to a 525 pound deadlift. Nice. <laughs> when you finally pull it, it feels pretty freaking good. Right. So th there is something very, very deep inside us that kind of desires that suffering or a challenge to overcome. And then, you know, it, it's never like happiness is never necessarily like a sustained state. Like you get that happiness in the doing. So when you finally right. do something, you feel good about it. You appreciate it. But I mean, almost instantly, anybody who's done anything that's worthwhile, you know, <laughs> the moment after you do something worthwhile, it's okay, what's next? Exactly. Right. I, and as you are, I'm sure I've already talked about it, know that testosterone makes effort feel good for men. Yes. And of course, there's <laughs> yes. a testosterone epidemic right now. And uh, really in the whole Western world. So you talk about fertility, you talk about the lack of children, which we are below replacement rate. And so um, you know, what we'll, we'll, we could discuss depopulation and, and why that is uh, something that is certainly favored by the globalist oligarchs. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, people just are so controlled by the technology and pleasure and the re the rewiring of their neurons through the dopamine hits mm -hmm. that you know, unfortunately, people don't have a uh, attention span. I mean, we're doing a live stream right here and this attracts yeah. the right type of audience. But for so many people, you know, reading and we're talking about literacy and, and IQ levels, reading is a huge part of the ability to be able to be a critical thinker. And I'm yeah. not here to say that everybody has to read novels or anything like that. But, right. you know, there is a there is a joke uh, that people, you know, who move their mouth when they read. Um, I forget which author it was, but they made a joke that my books aren't made for people who move their mouth when they read because you have to build up that interior voice mm -hmm. when you read. And that is the same voice that is utilized to critically think. And so people aren't really in control of themselves. And so that which is controlling them is their sexual desires. And I think that's one of the, the I know we're going to get into masculinity, but this is one of the big problems with men is because of the over sexualization of our society. We are not, you know, we're not having families, we're not having long term relationships, we're not having children, and yet those innate desires are still within us. And so then people sit there and masturbate, and they watch pornography, and they don't go out and get PRs, they don't focus on doing the hard effort work that makes you feel good. And I think that the journey to Christ is that process. So one of the gifts is not that you have a ecstatic euphoric experience and everything's good after that. It's mm -hmm. as we talked about with the fitness or anything that you do harder, completing a job, a job site. And then afterwards you feel good about the quality of work. Mm -hmm. That's the, that is the same metaphor for our lives and our journeys towards God. Like it's mm -hmm. the journey that is actually the reward. And that's what really makes people happy. And so as people pursue the hedonism, and whatever pleasure is offered and stimulated, you know, they they just become more and more weak, and they and they don't want the, that hard work. 